What did you want me to throw a conniption fit with those drawings of his, say, say some kind of a genius or something? What good would that do when I know the damn thing could never fly? Excuse me, Captain, but perhaps... Perhaps there is one other thing. The way it is now, some of these men may not last as long as the water. But they need to believe that there is hope for them. I don't know, Mr. Towns, but maybe to build a thing like this could be a lot of help. So we prove it can't fly and get killed in the process, is that it? What are you giving us, Doc? This is hard work. These men can't stand hard work. Watching each other die could be even harder. This is the emergency podcast system. This is not a test. Movies are bombing all over the country. They are posing as movies you already know. They may already be in your theaters, your neighbor's home, or even your own. Do not panic. Specialists have been dispatched. They will help you identify these pretenders and defend you against this invasion of the remake. Please stand by for further instructions. Lost five men. Gabriel in there, he's on the way. That'll be six. Are you, are you asking me to kill the rest of them trying to get a death trap off the ground? I don't know. I don't know. It won't work. It just can't work. All right, maybe it can't. Maybe it can't, and we'll all be killed. There's just one chance in a thousand that he has got something. Boy, I'd rather take it than just sit around here waiting to die. Welcome to the Invasion of the Remake podcast. I'm your host, Jason Bishop, and with me today, as always, is Sam Stepanenko. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're listening. (laughs) How the hell are you? Not too bad. It's a Sunday afternoon. It's sunny out. We've got plush temperatures. Yes, after a little bit of a brief cold snap. So brief, but it was really unpleasant because we're not used to it. it. We're used to having winter up here in Canada, and we've barely had any. So. It's been, yes. it's Little snippets of it. We yeah. had it back in October. <laughs> yeah, October and then like two days in January. Yeah, so yeah. far. Yeah. Knock on wood. Yes, knock on wood. <laughs> I don't know what's scarier, the fact that you knocked on your forehead and it still sounded like wood. (laughs) Probably a little bit of both. (laughs) Okay, today we're going to be talking about The Flight of the Phoenix. This is a movie, I'd seen the remake before, I I think I'd seen it with you, actually. I'm pretty sure we saw it together, yeah. Uh, But I'd never seen the original, I don't know about you. No, I've definitely not seen the original until now. Yeah, you know what? I don't know if you found it, like... Because when we watched the first time, I seem to remember actually quite enjoying the movie. I, th- I thought it was, like, decent. It was decent, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, not without my nitpicks. I seem to remember, especially when I rewatched this one, thinking they were a bit heavy-handed with Giovanni Ribisi, who's really good, his character. But I, I thought they kind of just made him so... Almost, almost a parody. Yeah. So heavy-handed and so almost... I don't know. Almost Asperger's. The, yeah. Well, there's a psychological term I'm thinking of um, where there's just no emotion to the character. Um, sociopathic? Sociopath. That's there that's it. Yeah. yeah. He's he's such a sociopath that I'm like, oof, you guys went a little overboard with that. And even then, and then you watch the original and you're like, oh, that, that wasn't that great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you watch the, watch the original and then you watch the remake again. So it's kind of weird when going into this, and especially after 172 episodes, and we're still, I still make this revelation once in a while, yeah. is if you don't have the context of the original, it's not a bad movie. It's still not a bad movie. Yeah. It's... There's some, there, there, it's I've got not some beefs. As, it's not as good if you do have it. That's exactly. If yeah. you do have that reference point. Exactly, yeah. Because 
this has been this one was a pleasant surprise because both of them were were very watchable and I and I didn't mm-hmm. walk out going oh fuck what a mess that remake was. Mm-hmm. There there were some messy points, but for the most part, I thought it was a pretty decent remake. All things considered, it's one of the better remakes I've seen. Yeah, well, let's see. IMDb gives the original a seven point six out of ten, with a Rotten Tomatoes score of like ninety percent critic score and an eighty one percent audience score. So it uh, rates fairly high. And then we get to the remake, and IMDb, it's, you know, 6.1 out of 10, so and it's still a decent rating, I think, for, I think that's in balance for that film, being not quite as good, but decent watch. But Rotten Tomatoes, whoo boy, <laughs> <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes, the critic score will drop down to, um, yeah, blistering 30%. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little unfair i think i think so too and 40 percent audience score so also a little unfair I, yeah and it's and like, i get the feeling it's people who really love the original that are really rating it poorly i don't think it's bad i think both these movies have incredible casts they have incredible casts and some really amazing performances mm-hmm. like amazing performances one of the performances i didn't think was so great was dennis quaid yeah i, th- I think that he and maybe it was the way they wrote him because he I, I disliked him for the first two thirds of the movie. I I, I, I think the the script in general wasn't as strong, and certain actors were trying to make it better with what they had, and the Giovanni Ribisi certainly was one of them. Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, Quaid does unlikable really well, mm-hmm. but it didn't work for this particular character because right up until his the, the scene where he makes the agreement with. The guy who walks away, if we're not going to make this plane, I'm going to walk home. Mm. Guy. That, it wasn't until that point where he started to become a little bit more likable. And it's really hard to see that transition because it, I, I understood the reluctance that, of Jimmy Stewart's character to move forward because, because he was unsure. But Quaid's version of that character was just a dick for the first half of the movie. Yeah, he just wouldn't listen to anybody. Yeah. And it, I, I mean, it, at least with, with uh, Jimmy Stewart, it was... Part of it, pride and stubbornness, and and just a genuine like this seems like a far stretch. I'd rather try to keep my people alive as long as possible. Already feeling responsible for the deaths that have already happened. Exactly, and yeah, you never did get that from Quaid's character that 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 feeling of responsibility, even though he is responsible, mm-hmm. right? Because because of the decision he made. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he he was. I mean, the performance wasn't bad. It's just the way that yeah, I think it was the way the character was was written because I don't think. Quaid's ever turned in a truly bad performance. No, no. The original film was based on the novel by Dudley Smith, writing as Elliston Trevor of the book uh, title of the same name, The Flight of the Phoenix, and the screenplay by was by Lucas Heller, who wrote The Dirty Dozen and What Happened to Baby Jane. That was 1965. And that explains an awful lot about how strong this script was. Even mm. at over two hours, this movie was really watchable. I remember I, I texted you and gave you heck. I'm like, you're making me watch a two-hour, 22-minute movie? <laughs> that one doesn't feel like it. It's a joy. There's a lot of... There's time spent on the characters and uh, that I think is very important, especially with as big of a cast as you have. You need to kind of get to know them and uh, shaving that 20 minutes off of the remake and giving more time to more action-oriented sequences really diminishes the characters. In some well, cases, uh, they almost feel throwaway. Well, and that's, there's, there's part of that. And I think that the long runtime really drew you into the tension of the movie mm-hmm. because it took so long before to get to the climax yeah you're, well you're, you also feel like they've been there for a while yeah and there's as they're constructing the plane or i guess we're skipping to to the the plot here of the this movie basically these guys have crashed in the desert this plane that's picked up these passengers from i do believe oil a, field, yeah. a closed oil field a closing yeah a closing oil field and i think that's a plot for both of them and it crashes in the desert Two different deserts, though. <laughs> yes. Uh, the remakes, go the Gobi Desert. I don't think I ever picked up on what the original one was. It was just a desert. A desert, really but, but it was more of an Arabic country yeah. where the remake was closer to Mongolia. Yes. Yeah, yep. so that was the Gobi Desert. 
and the plane crashes and it's a survival story for the most part and you get to spend time with them just trying to figure out okay we have this much water we can do this many days as long as we're taking it easy and they're figuring somebody's going to find them yeah 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 that all that all that really great subplot mm-hmm. about the water was almost entirely missing in the remake except for the one scene where that one jug gets broken yeah and that's that's the only time where they really stress how important the water is. Yeah, and they got, I mean, in the remake, they actually have more water than the, the original guys do as far as what can last and uh, all the stuff that happens to be on board are like canned peaches and stuff, so they're all canned in a water base. Yeah, <laughs> versus in the, re- in the original where they actually... It was like dried dates. <laughs> it was like dried dates and stuff, and, yeah. and they actually make a distiller to distill the antifreeze so they have more water. Yeah. Which far more interesting mm-hmm. uh, and it, it really lends some authenticity to the aircraft designer character yeah yeah no that that character heinrich dorfman which was uh played by hardy krueger and of course that was giovanni rubisi's uh character in the remake as elliot they yeah. i think everybody except for the dennis quaid's uh the the pilot frank yeah. towns has got a name change in this yeah i think so as well but and well, and they changed a lot because I mean, in the, in the original, you had the Hugh Laurie character character replace the military captain on the in the original. Mm-hmm. Like, like he was obviously yeah. They made it more of a corporate thing yeah. rather than transporting military uh, that were were kind of hitching a ride on this. Yeah, it, it makes more sense in context of a mod- more modern film mm-hmm. right? because that one we came out. I mean, back during the Cold War when the military would have been. Mm-hmm out in deserts and, and making observations about, about the state of the world, as it were. So it did, I, I, that change didn't bother me at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually, that was one of the few changes I did enjoy. Mm-hmm. Is, is getting but better. we kind of lose the whole story with the sergeant as well because of it. There, and there is some of that. But There's that military aspect was, well, fuck, we're, we're survivors now. It's not a military operation anymore. I'm not going to go on a suicide mission just because you order me to. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know that it, that adds anything to the original. No, but I thought he was a very interesting character, the sergeant. He was. I was expecting more from him actually and it's it's weird because yeah you do expect him to kind of have a turnaround in character yeah but it never quite yeah. happens but when you think about it it's like yeah he's right oh he's absolutely right. i mean it's not out of cowardice no it's he's absolutely right he just, just doesn't want to die yeah, yeah i mean the whole <laughs> there's, there's a lot of focus on him in the movie like there, there's a lot mm. of shots of just him looking really I don't even know the word I'm looking for, but there's there's this look on his face, and I can't explain it. You have to watch it to it, sort of see it. There's yeah, because, I, I mean, it originally feels like it's guilt, but then the, he, there's it's a like disdain. There's a pl- plotting something as well. Like there's yeah, like, you always feel like there's something underhanded here. He's kind of hoping his commanding officer was going to die when he goes walking in the desert. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's some of that. But even after the, the, the captain leaves, you see these scenes, and maybe it is guilt, but it comes across as plotting. Mm-hmm. Like he's like you're expecting a sort of this this I like him to be a saboteur of some sort for some reason mm-hmm. almost because there's a, there's just not there's this look like you just can't quite trust him yeah almost makes me think there might be a subplot missing there because it didn't it does feel like there's something missing there and you don't quite understand the emotions that are on his face yeah and I I think that by getting rid of that character in the remake uh, one knocked some is part of what knocked some of that time out is yeah. that getting rid of that subplot and then getting rid of all those. I mean, and there's probably a good five or six minutes of shots of of him looking like that in the in the original. <laughs> this is my forlorn face. This yeah. is my <laughs> this is my I'm going to do something evil, but I'm not face. <laughs> I, but yeah, the character it's I, mime class that that culmination with where he, where he gets into that discussion with the captain is very very t- compelling. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no question that that's a really compelling moment in the film. Mm-hmm. And it is definitely something that is missing from the, the the remake. But on the whole, I think the remake still made use of that event in a very different way. And I, it's one of the things we talk about when we talk about re- making remakes is don't make it remake note for note. And they didn't. No, I think the major beats are certainly in the remake. Most of the character ciphers are there, yeah. even though they're named differently, are kind of there. How they're used is somewhat sometimes different. Yes. They'll just use them briefly because i mean jared padalecki he was easily ernest borgnine's character oh, as was, far as the one sure, that yeah. kind of 
can't deal with the situation well and a little more simple minded, but they do away with them within the, the five minutes of the crash. Yeah, it, yeah. They set up Padalecki's character to be interesting at least for a little while, and then it was actually disappointing that they got rid of him so quickly. Yeah, right. well, he had to go back to to his TV series that they won't let him go from. Yes, <laughs> free Jensen Ackles and Jerry Padalecki. Yeah, you can leave Jared. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know what? Jared Padalecki is a pretty competent actor. In, he is. And, he is. Uh, they, like I said, both these casts are pretty incredible. I think Padalecki was. Uh, this was. I got a free weekend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there's. Just, I guess that's part of it yeah because but but yeah because borgnine's character i mean he actually got developed right yeah yeah you see yeah. his his kind of mental decline where the, he just can't deal with this the stress of the situation there's an obsessive compulsiveness to the character where he's not willing to share what's his and his luggage and stuff but when he realizes that this can help others and he feels good about that then he just starts giving everything away. yeah well and <laughs> It, he also thinks he's going to live because he's going to go on a walkabout with the commander. And then they and stop him because because he's, they, he's had a mental breakdown. Yeah, he's right? had a breakdown. And he's the oldest, I think, person in the the, the oldest passenger. Yes. Yeah. On yeah. that plane. So. But yeah, it, because it, there's a point there where he seems almost simple minded, mm-hmm. right? uh, which is kind of a Borgnine trope, especially at that point in his career. Yeah. But... But yeah, it's it's because he's broken. It's, it's something something happened to him that they don't talk about. That where where he just kind of broke and couldn't function properly anymore. Yeah, right. yeah. I'm not sure if I really like that portrayal, but I, yeah, it was. You felt bad when he well goes. Uh, they didn't give you that with Pedro like his character. That was the point no. I'm getting at, right? Is, no, is whether we liked it or not, they didn't give you. You don't get any time to get attached to him. You, he barely gets any of any lines before that moment. He goes out in a windstorm to take a leak, falls over a dune, can't see his way back, and dies in the storm. Yes, and there's that great scene where they show his wind and sand chafed body. Yeah, right? and just like briefly. up to up above his waist. Yeah, and, yeah, just poking out of the the dune. Yeah, and it, and it was a great way to show how unforgiving this desert is. Yeah, right. Like it, it was really, really powerful, and it, it actually goes to one of the other things I really liked about the remake. They did it in the in the original as well, but not as well as they did in the remake. Is little things like kudos to the costume designers for the, for what they did with this movie because they focused on people's footwear. And showed how the sand had worn them away. Mm-hmm. I, like they showed this scene of Heloy's feet, right? Where it, early in the movie, where he's wearing his brand new shiny corporate shoes, and then later on in the movie, they are almost falling off his feet. Yeah, but I wish makeup had given the same amount of time, like it did in, in the, the original. Yeah, exactly, they did. As, as you start seeing them getting chafed and all these sores yeah. and dehydration and just the effects on the body of not having proper nutrition as well as this the blistering temperatures and, and it's the lots sun, of, they're working in the sun which is is yeah so yeah. they're getting sunburns and third degree burns and blisters and all sorts of stuff and you're seeing the results of that uh, with the, on their skin and their, with the makeup and uh, and that was, you see that gradually over time as well and i thought that was really good i didn't think the makeup was spectacular but it was probably good for the time it was good for the time and again it shows that same attention to detail yeah right it's like it's like the remake took a different angle on it and chose to go with changing their appearance to their to the the way their clothes wore out and the shoes wore out but but yeah the shoes it was just so i'm going back to the shoes because it was just so such a fine detail Mm -hmm. right because we all know how hard sand is on everything yeah. Right? And, and especially footwear, especially if you're walking around and working in the sand. And the fact that they, they showed that wear was really impressive. But yeah, they missed that the opportunity to add something new to it by also doing the, the, the makeup, showing the, showing how the effects of the sun and, yeah. and the dehydration. Well, yeah, I mean, you do see the effects on their clothes in the original as well. Yeah. They get more tattered. And I think at one point we see Jimmy Stewart's pants being held up by like some sort of drawstring of yes. some sort. Yeah. So. We do see it. <laughs> we do see it to a certain extent. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's. it's uh, but I, I, for some reason, I just noticed it a lot. The, the in in the remake, probably maybe because they weren't doing the makeup like they did in the original, right? So yeah, you're see, looking for those other details that yeah. would show that passage of time. Yeah. 
I agree. So uh, this movie's called The Flight of the Phoenix, not because the plane's called the Phoenix, but the plane that they build out of the plane that crashed which, is called the which, Phoenix. Yeah. The, the big point of this movie that we forgot to mention <laughs> is they, to survive this, they've been convinced by this German model builder, or American one based on the remake of Giovanni Ribisi, who's come up with the designs and figured out that there's enough working parts on this crash plane to build a new one. Yes, but we don't know he's a model designer. No, that is that is the, the hook at the end of this movie. Yes. Which I think is a, a brilliant little twist. It is. I l- liked it better in the original. I did too. I really like how it's so... And it just shows that matter of fact that character. He's so confident in his skills that... He doesn't even see that as a, as any kind of problem. It, like he builds powered planes, they just are small. And of course, you know, to any other layman, a model or toy plane, and he gets really offended at the term toy. Yes, that the physics aren't the same. You know, it's just the larger scale gives more problems, but everything design wise is about the same. It's yes. just the scale. So. He doesn't even see that as an issue when they make that discovery. And he just calmly explains, like, yeah, yeah, this is my favorite, the one I'd, I've designed. And he walks off, and and there's Richard Attenborough. It's like, he didn't even think to lie to us <laughs> about it. It didn't matter to him. It is the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's far more powerful. And, and that's, yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, and I, that was I, probably the biggest flaw in the remake, is instead of creating tension through time, like mm-hmm. they did in the original, and and small conflicts, right? Yeah. All the conflicts were blown huge, every single one of them. Right? It was shouting and fisticuffs and... Yeah, well, and you don't get the... At times, because he is such an unlikable character at times, you do actually see him grow as a person in the original film. The German designer Heinrich Dorfman, Hardy Kruger. You see him develop as a character and uh, be united in this task and the conflict between him and uh, Frank Towns. But that whole story, part of the story is told much better in the original. Absolutely. I mean, I mean it's, it's the, the, unfortunately, it's the thing that we seem to notice most often is there are, in trying to change the film, they take away sometimes the best aspects, the of, best the aspects of the characters. And, you know, it was, yeah, because were t- those were the times where you actually started to see him a little more likable. And everything's so matter-of-fact with that character. Well, he, he even cops to it. He's like, oh, water's gone missing. Well, it's because he hasn't been sleeping. He's been working night and day, yeah. and so he requires more water. And you can't even argue with him. Yeah, you can't argue with him. He just didn't think, why didn't you ask? Well, you would have said no. Yeah, yeah and... and- <laughs> And then he, you know, when when it becomes an issue, he gives up his rations and pours it back in because he wants to he wants to keep the peace and keep happy workers and and keep the work moving forward. Yeah, exactly. They did make him a very stereotypical German, sort of that staid, matter of fact kind of character, which was very common in the sixties as well. Yeah, right? yeah. He's, he's, at least they had a German actor. Yes, at least they did <laughs> use a German actor for it. Um, and again, yeah, he, he was he was he moderated between uh, between likable and unlikable, and that, that made him kind of interesting actually, mm-hmm. because it's like because you kind of respect him when he comes up with the idea at first to change the plane, and then his temper tantrum, right? Because he becomes like a pouty child yeah. right? until everybody agrees to go ahead and move forward with it. Yeah, that's where sometimes it bothers me where people kind of have these childish reactions. And I think they kind of did away with uh, the more childish aspects of certain characters in the remake, which I kind of appreciated. But I guess in some cases, that's just what pride is. There are, you know, people will react in a childish way, whether they're kids or not. Yeah, it's true. All right, well, I think it's time to run the trailer. We're going to run the trailer here for the 1965, The Flight of the Phoenix. Don't forget to put it down in your diary. How very, very nice it was at the party here till the booze run out. It's not a party. There is no booze. It is a most unusual motion picture where the excitement never runs out. This 
was the best-selling novel of man's pride and fury. And this is the motion picture, exulting in the vastness of human hope and human courage to scale new heights of adventure. Telling you this. If it happens again and I see who's doing it, I'll kill him. If we don't go back to work, we're gonna die. All of us. What was that? I'm not going! I don't think you've quite understood. I'm giving you an order. You ought to come with me. Now let me tell you something that makes nonsense out of this whole thing. Please do. And I'm not going to give you the old veteran flyer routine, Mr. Dorfman. The only thing outstanding about you, Mr. Towns, is your stupidity. Ah! Easy, easy. Ah! Ah! Easy. Ah! Easy. Ah! Arabs, can they see him from up there? Can't they? They got camels. They could take us out of here. Nine men whose very lives on one of the most startling, ironic twists of fate you have ever experienced in a motion picture. Unusual men. Star dancers. Superb performances from a cast of brilliant stars assembled from around the world. picture sets the screen on fire. All right, that was The Flight of the Phoenix from 1965. And yeah, sometimes movies set the screen of fire. And sometimes they crash and burn like the plane that's in the movie. And unfortunately, both these films did crash and burn at the box office. I didn't find a box office for the 1965, but it didn't do well. <laughs> and uh, the the remake, which was budgeted at $45 million, grossed a little over $21 million in the U.S., and then I think it had like around thirty-five million with uh, other uh, ad add-ins for the box office and probably rentals as well. Uh, I did find that the the original did about three million in rental sales. Much, much, much later because it was nineteen sixty-five. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it would have been at least twenty years later. Yeah. Yeah. So, not so good, but the original budget was uh, $5.355 million, which is pretty big for 1965. I did a calculation on it, and by 2018 standards, that would have been about $42 million. So, fairly comparable to the remake. Fairly, yeah. I'd say, yeah. And I think in both these movies, that was largely salaries. Oh, well, for sure. You got five fucking Oscar winners in this movie. Yeah. The original film stars James Stewart. And we I can't believe we've never got a chance to talk about Jimmy Stewart until now. Yes. But uh, certainly glad I did. And he's been in tons of great stuff. Uh, Vertigo. Lots, lots of Hitchcock stuff, actually. Uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Richard Attenborough, who's famous not just for his acting, but his directing, is a producer on Gandhi, and most people rec recognize him as the kindly old man from Jurassic Park. From Jurassic Park, yes. <laughs> and he was in one of our episodes before. It was, was a he? smaller role, but he was in Network, episode 75. Ah, well, yes. Well, so was Peter Finch. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> this movie was actually directed by Robert Aldrich, who directed The Dirty Dozen, What Happened to Baby Jane, and episode 156, we talked about another one of his movies, The Longest Yard. Oh, yes. 
That was a fun one. It was a fun one. As I said, uh, Peter Finch is also in this movie. Hardy Kruger from A Bridge Too Far, which Richard Attenborough directed. Ernest Borgnine, we talked about in episode 69, The Poseidon Adventure. Ian Bannon's also in this. People might know him from Braveheart. Uh, Ronald Frazier was Sergeant Watson. Christian Marquard was uh, Dr. Renaud, and he was in Apocalypse Now. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Dan Daria was also in this movie, along with George Kennedy, who we talked about in episode 144, Charade. Oh, my. <laughs> I had forgotten that he was in that. And I, when I was looking to sort of... I, I'm going, I know we've had George Kennedy. I know we've had George Kennedy, but I could not find the movie that, that he was in. Well, there you go. Five Oscar winners in this movie and uh, several more nominees. So, like... On paper, this movie should have done well. It should have done huge box office with yeah. cast like that. And it's just baffling that it didn't. I mean, yeah, this might have been past Jimmy Stewart's box office draw, but I don't know. I mean, it's still Jimmy Stewart. It's still Jimmy Stewart, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, when, you, when you have add-ons like Borgnine and Kennedy and Attenborough. Yeah, it's like, I mean, Borgnine was hot at this point. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, when... Even with a cast like... I mean, like Kennedy Mc- barely had lines. Uh, he, I know. He was... It, it, <laughs> he was so under, underutilized in this movie. He was really under... A lot of these actors were. And I think that might have been what happened. Is it, it maybe did really well its opening weekend. And then people went, well, Borgnine dies really early. Kennedy has no lines. Attenborough doesn't even have that much dialogue. Oh, but his dialogue is very important when it, it happens. It is very important. He, he is the conscience of this entire crew of people, crew and passengers. He really kind of keeps everybody stable, which, you know, at the beginning you think he's just going to be a drunk through the movie. Yes. Because they kind of acknowledge he's got a drinking problem, but that goes away right away. It doesn't even come up really again. I think it, it does. There's one, one spot where, where, a little he, bit where of he dialogue. finds with Frank. Yeah, and, yeah, and Frank calls him an alcoholic or something and there, there's some bitter feelings there but they make up fairly quickly yeah they do but and i but i think that's maybe what happened was a lot of people saying well well borgdine's hardly in it kennedy's hardly in it yeah attenborough really doesn't get a lot of screen time he's very important but he doesn't get as much screen time as you'd think right? yeah right it really does focus on jimmy stewart and uh hardy krueger hardy krueger yes yeah right? for sure like they're 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 by far the most significant characters in, in, in the original movie in terms of screen time. And then, of course, the sergeant, who gets a lot of screen time. Like, he gets a lot, like a surprising amount of screen time. Yeah, Ronald Frazier gets a lot, um, which is funny considering you got Peter Finch as his commanding officer, yeah. who disappears for a good third of the film. At least. Yeah, because he goes, he tries to walk to the nearest oasis, s- yeah. oasis or city. With another character who doesn't come back, but the captain actually makes his way, finds his way back to the the plane, which is crazy. (laughs) Which is crazy. Uh, And actually, that reminds me of something that was definitely missing from the original, or from the remake, is there's, in the original, there's that one character who's so badly injured that they know he's going to die. Yeah. And they just completely got rid of him. Yeah, they don't use him at all. Right. And I I thought that was a really important point because that Mm -hmm. kind of created some of the tension and was really a reference point for the timelines that they were trying to set once they decided they are going to build the plane. Yeah, and the French doctor is is quite important within the cast as well because he's actually also the one that seeds that thought of giving the people hope to Frank. Yeah, and, and that changes over to a different character in the remake. But the other thing about the Doctor is, one, is he's... Yeah, in fact, in fact, a lot of uh, Richard Attenborough's uh, stuff is kind of spread out through the characters it, as well. It is, yeah. It's because, because yeah, the Tyrese character really... Just doesn't have that, yeah. No, he, he, he gets a lot of screen time, but not a lot of dialogue, and doesn't really do anything, yeah. to be honest. But back to the Doctor, is part of that, that character development of Borgnine is, is that the Doctor has said that he's not fit for duty anymore. Mm. Right, and then and then because there's then there's that argument with him where where he says, well, you 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 keep bringing me down, you keep keeping me from doing the things I need to do or I want to do, because the doctor says you're not you're not equipped to go on this trip, yeah, right? and talks him out of it. So, and, and, and again, that's what makes this the, the remake just that, that much that little bit stronger. Yeah, is, all, and th- those arguments are always great to watch because, okay, Captain wants to go in the desert. He set his mind to do it, regardless of the logic of it all Uh, they're like well okay are you right-handed well 
you, that means your right leg's going to have a longer stride. You're going to walk in circles. There's a very specific point you have to hit as well. If the, the dunes change, this map is out of out of whack because you know it was made ten years ago. Like so on and so on. And so, so many reasons for not to make the track other than dying. Yes, <laughs> and they do that really well in the remake too. Yeah. They they take that almost verbatim match. Yeah, yeah. It's almost straight from the original. Yeah. Which is good because it's it is really important. Yeah. Right? But in the end, they actually talk them out, talk them out of going for the for. Yeah, the and the one guy not in the conversation is the one that leaves. Yes, <laughs> but for different reasons. Yeah, right. He makes a conscious decision: says, either I'm going to die here or I'm going to die trying. Yeah, right. and it didn't feel like the rest of them were going to try to do anything yeah. at the time when he left. They don't do a very good job of that because I don't even think they came up with the whole build the plane idea yet. Yeah, they had because there's, there's that because there's that because it happened. Yeah, that does happen really quickly in the remake. It does well, not that quickly because that, it happens after Frank goes after the character who walks away right. because he had said we're not building the plane. Right, right. It's a waste of time. Let's conserve our water and hope for rescue. Right, and then that's when that's when he decides is well, if we're not going to build the plane, if we're not going to try here, yeah. I'm going to try on my own. Yeah, right? and then he then he has that discussion. They have to talk about the watch, and they talk about hope. Oh, all the concentration on the fucking watch. <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> well, I gave my watch to the, my buddy. He, I, they find his body, but it, with no watch, watch yeah. which is a clue to their that the what has been ransacked from part of the plane that got exploded out of the back yeah. where this guy got ejected from has been ransacked by nomads. Yeah. So, so it's the introduction of the idea of the nomads and the risk of them. And they introduced them really early it, versus in the, in the remake. The, the, well, they're trying the to create more tension yeah. because of the nomads. Yeah. And they, and they don't do that at all in the, in, in the original movie. They don't even think about it until, until they show up. Really? Yeah. 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 But I have a question. Okay. The debris Mm-hmm. And that scene, <laughs> it was all books. It was. <laughs> crappy, well, not crappy, but f- like fictional, something that they could have left, they would not have put on the plane because of weight concerns. <laughs> I'm like, I, 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 Especially considering weight concerns were part of the problem. Yes. Like you got an extra passenger you didn't plan for, you've got all this crap. Why did they pack... They even make a question of, uh, during that film was like, uh, what's the piping worth that we loaded up? Yeah. Not much. <laughs> like, well, why take it? Exactly. But yeah, the, the, but the books really threw me off. I'm like, because I know how much uh, like a box of books weighs. I mean, a good bo- a box, like if you have a full box of books, you're looking at 50, 60 pounds minimum. And yeah, they that's probably just had, like, a, like an apple crate. Yeah. And they had a lot of books. Like they had yeah. probably... Five six hundred books strewn all over that crash site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're probably looking at uh, you know five hundred pounds or more of, of, of books, books that were strewn all over the place that didn't need to be on that plane. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's nineteen. It, well, hey, wait a minute. This would have been two thousand and four. Like, were Kobo's around at that point? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, none of these characters strike me as readers. No, I oh, and fucking Hugh Laurie's phone. He's constantly playing with his fucking phone. Yeah, so it's just Check, pre e reader because it was a PDA. It was one of those. It, yeah, I'm like, why are you charging this thing? <laughs> like, well, it's, it's the same with the I electric char- razor. Yeah, in, in have, both movies. Yeah, I have to charge my. Well, my breeze. My I have an electric razor. I only have to charge it about once a week. Whereas my phone, I'm charging twice a day. <laughs> yeah, but there's an electric razor that, that, that Frank uses in the remake, and then somebody else is using it in the original. I can't remember who was using it in the original, but there's this whole thing where, where they're like, where's this power coming from? Yeah. Right? Because I can't imagine that they'd be using batteries because one of the. Well, we already know that plane doesn't use battery power exactly, to start the a, engines. Exactly. That's just where I was yeah. going. Yeah. Because cause it has the, the firing cartridges yeah. to start the engine instead. It, it cuts down on the weight of the plane. Which is a very much a plot point in both movies. Yeah. But more so in the original. Again, one of those things where they took stuff out that should have been left in. right? Because the firing cartridges are a huge source of conflict between our designer and our pilot. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Because they only have a limited amount of cartridges to fire off. And it's uh, you know very important to get this plane started, <laughs> and they don't, they can't waste it. 
And they, there's even even fuels a bit of an issue too. Because and they, they definitely make it more of an issue in the remake. Yeah, when when the accident happens, that blows up some of their fuel that they're using to uh, light fires so they can work mm. at night. Yeah. And when that goes up. Oh, boy. Yes. <laughs> they can't use it anymore. Yeah, which means they have to work during the day, which really should have fed into that, that makeup of, of them, their their skin getting burnt and yeah. sores and all that stuff. Because if you're working in the daytime in a desert, you are going to dehydrate. You are going to get way more worn and you're going to get sores and you're going to have peeling skin. And I didn't do that. And it's because the cast is so fucking pretty. Right? They, didn't <laughs> want, they didn't want to make them ugly. Yeah. Right, and that's because that's a very much a precept of of modern filmmaking is you can't make your lead actors ugly. Yeah, I guess you know if they had established that they had brought a generator from the work site, but again, that would have used fuel that they couldn't use anymore. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right? But and the weight as well. But yeah. I mean, that might have explained some of the stuff that's still working that you can plug into it. But if you're Using a generator, generators make a shit ton of noise. So <laughs> yes, yeah, and we we would have known. <laughs> yeah, and that's again one of the things that the original did better uh, is everybody their their personal grooming went out the window. Yeah, right. They they grew beards. Like Jimmy Stewart was looking really grizzled by the end of the movie. Yeah, in the remake, I mean uh, the Finger Styles character. Um, Jesus Christ! <laughs> who was useless? But sticky, sticky fingers. Sticky fingers. That's what it was. Yeah. For fuck's sakes! I can't believe I even wrote that down as a name. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he calls himself. Um, it, but it he, is. He's, he was a good blade, though. <laughs> yeah, he was. Uh, but his head. He managed to keep his head clean shaven for the entire time. No water. Yeah. Electric razor. Was he using that electric razor on his head? I, I mean, what? They missed some stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, when the electric razor comes up. You see in the original, Frank loses his shit on yeah. the guy for shaving. I think at the time, because he was trying to hear something in the background, but and that was when the the nomads were coming by. Yeah. He could hear them, and he didn't want to be, them to be alerted. Anybody who's wandering in the desert out there is probably not... That's probably not a good thing. It's probably not a good thing, and they make that very clear in both movies, actually, yeah. but they very differently in both movies. And I don't... My, didn't mind the change that they made in the in the remake for that because mm-hmm. um, they had to because yeah. they didn't have the military aspect of it so they they had to make some changes to make it a little more dramatic yeah but yeah the razor I mean it, it, it served no purpose whatsoever in the remake at all they could have left it out and nobody would have noticed yeah yeah because it doesn't come up as any kind of plot point whatsoever no I, I mean the nomads in the original kind of pass by they make it very clear that. If they're going to make contact, they're going to try their damnedest to not give away their location. Yes. Yeah. And uh, they do kind of tackle that in some of the dialogue because when they send them down, they kind of do it from afar and we don't get to hear the conversation and see the conversation, what happens. And that's something the remake changes is they go down to communicate with the nomads and have negotiations and uh, we get to hear some of that dialogue that happens between them and the nomads trying to figure out where they are because that that's resources they can strip, right? Exactly, and, and and it culminates in something that leads into something really, really interesting, actually, in the, yeah. later on in the movie, which worked really well for me. Yeah, right? well, I mean, there's a little more action in the remake, but I Not do... Not f- a lot, but, in, but just I, enough. Ju- just enough to make those scenes feel more exciting yeah. but i think that there's more also, tension in the other one that's because, it decreases don't know the tension what's happening. because because there's all yeah. these moments where you get a little bit of release and you don't feel that there's a certain amount anxiety. of expectation yeah. that you know okay so this is gonna end badly yeah not as badly as the original because the two guys that went down they they did yeah, they did <laughs> they yeah. both they both got killed yeah and one 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 of the crew members does get killed in that in the remake as well yes yeah. but they and there's a firefight and uh, miraculously the the people who've been trapped in the desert all this time are still better shots than the nomads <laughs> yes well the one person because it, it it's it's all frank right? yeah it really right. is all frank yeah. right and uh, well, that's because he's the hero could, yeah he's an asshole but he's the hero. The other thing I don't that, that bothered me about Frank's character in this one is, in the original, they give Frank a lot of they don't like they've done a lot of backstory, but they talk about his his past quite a bit, yeah. right? Whereas in this one, they don't talk about Frank's past at all. No, right? there's no they don't give a reason for him being 
a pilot for an oil company and a beat up. I mean, it's a pretty yeah. Guy. The only past we have is he's got a reputation of being the guy that flies these guys out when they they close. He's yeah. the cleanup guy. I'm like, well, he's just the guy they hired to do that. It sucks that he's got that reputation, but that's what he's being paid to do. But that's really the only pass we get. Is yeah. the, here's the guy that closes people down and puts people out of work. Yeah. Whereas the Frank in the original, they talk about how he was a pilot in the war and he was a he's flown just about every 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 plane plane known to man at the time. Mm-hmm. Like he's, they, they explain how competent he is as a as a pilot. So this whole accident was. They try to explain that. They try to explain that this is not this accident was something that could have happened to anybody. Yeah, trying to take some of the onus off Frank, even though he's also to a certain extent taking some of the responsibility because he has that much confidence in his abilities. And with Quaid's version of Frank, it comes across as arrogance, right? Right, because you don't have that explanation that comes from Attenborough's character, right? And so it's one of those things where you, they they stripped down the characters to the point where they just don't feel as real. Yeah, we're just kind of getting quick ciphers of, of the originals. In some cases, they're completely erased. Yes, because the only the only character that really got any development at all was the cook, <laughs> right? You got a backstory, you got his, his girlfriend, you got his plans for, for the future, and... He was by far the most entertaining. That scene where he's trying to, where, where, the, where he's going to weld together the, the wings. And oh, all, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It was, it was genius. It was so well done. <laughs> so, yeah, it's weird that one of these secondary characters really is the best developed of the characters. Yeah, you feel for him. It's like, oh, no, did he just get squished? Because you like him, right? Yeah, you do. He's the one, only one that you re- actually feel well, anything for you know, aside from the scene. There's certain characters I liked and I thought, if they would have given them some more time, oh, the audience would have really liked them. Like Tony Coran, I thought was fantastic in the movie, and Kavork Mal- Malikian. Most people know him from Indiana Jones and uh, The Last Crusade, but I thought he was also really good. There's just a certain presence to those two actors that I thought were great. So when Coran was killed during that little meeting with the nomads, I was like, oh, God damn it. Yeah. He's my favorite one. Well, yeah, he, I, I, I enjoyed him just because he, because he was one of those guys who just says what was on his mind. He was no hold barred. And he, certainly he was, he was like the tension breaker in the movie, right? Because yeah. he'd say something horribly inappropriate to anybody and all of a sudden, all the all the angst and tension was focused on him. Yeah, I, you know, I got the feeling he was kind of meant to be the Joker from yeah. the original film, but I think they balanced him better. Oh, for sure, for yeah. sure, he was better written for what we got from him. Yeah, right. but but we didn't get enough of him. Well, let's give you a taste. Let's run the trailer for the two thousand and four. <laughs> miles west of our course it's a big desert isn't it this one's coming for us though right what kind of odds do you give us no radio very little water if we try to walk out of here we're gonna last about two days i suppose there'd be a four seasons hotel out here would it i can get us out of here what do you know about airplanes i designed them what the hell is he talking about He's talking about building a new airplane. Out of the old one. For 10 survivors, choosing to do the impossible is the only choice they've got. If a man can't have faith in something, what else does he have? We're either all in this together or no one at all. I'm in charge and I don't need to ask anyone anything. I'm not taking orders from you. What are they waiting for? I'm waiting till we're too weak to fight back. Ah! Do not tell them what a plane is. Ah! You're going to get out of here. Come on, give me some help. It's coming. It's going to fall at 100 miles an hour. We got to cover the edge. We just need more time. Everyone here is dispersed. 
indefensible except me. Can we finish the airplane? Say please. All right, that was the 2004 Flight of the Phoenix trailer directed by John Moore, who directed movies like Behind the Enemy Lines, which was a half-decent movie, and then some not-so-good ones like Max Payne and A Good Day to Die Hard. I'm never going to forgive you for that. (laughs) (laughs) And we also talked about him in episode 159 when we talked about The Omen just a couple months ago in October. Uh, the screenplay was by Scott Frank, who wrote Logan, The Lookout, Out of Sight, Minority Report, all good movies. And uh, Edward Burns, who's uh, mainly known as an actor, but uh, he was in Saving Private Ryan. And uh, that's that's good caliber, even though you were acting in the movie, not writing it. But, you know, I'll, gi- well, I'll, I'll give you props. He's done a ton of like stuff that he's done himself. That, oh, yeah. yeah. Mo- this is, uh, I think, the only writing gig he did that was like for, for somebody hire else. for somebody else that wasn't for him for for one of his films so this movie starred dennis quaid as frank towns we talked about him in episode 158 dreamscape also you know the same month we did it was like the episode just before the omen come on and miranda otto the only female member of this cast which there was no female cast members in the original miranda otto was uh we talked about her in episode 130, War of the Worlds, uh, she plays Kelly Johnson in this movie. Giovanni Rabisi, we talked about way, 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 way back in episode 11, pre-Sam in Gone in 60 Seconds. Yep. Tyrese Gibson, best known for his role on Fast and the Furious, plays AJ. And uh, also famous for being a social media diva. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Stay off social media, man. It's not your thing. <laughs> yeah, if it gets you in trouble, you shouldn't do it. Yeah, just cough, come off a little whiny. I need to feed my kids. <laughs> no, Rock, don't make movies. Right. <laughs> Tell the highest grossing actor in the world not to make movies. That's good. <laughs> and, the, and possibly the hardest working actor. The guy's on everything. He, I, th- I think he works 365 days a year. Oh, yeah. I don't 20 think, hours a day. I think he sleeps like three hours a day, maybe. <laughs> he's, he's definitely got a hell of a work ethic. Uh, Tony Curran, we talked about. He... Um, You know, he hasn't got, like, the super big memorable roles, but I certainly remember him as the Invisible Man guy in Leave Extraordinary Gentlemen, which wasn't exactly a hit. (laughs) It was pretty much anything but. Well, yeah, it pretty much made Sean Connery not want to act anymore. (laughs) Thankfully, not Tony Curran. (laughs) Uh, Sticky Fingers (sighs) plays Jeremy, and uh, he was on the short-lived Blade TV series, which... I liked it. They spent some money on it. It looked really good. I thought he was a decent blade. Fortunately, the, the series itself is kind of flat. It just, like, it, it works. It just doesn't have those highs and lows. Everything has this a, a, a kind of even tone throughout the thing. And well, that's, that was probably why it didn't get a second season. Yeah, the subject matter was, especially following those movies, where yeah. it's hard to do that in a sort of a, a, a TV friendly atmosphere. Yeah, they had a different venue for it, like HBO or. Well, they, like I mean, they were pushing the limits at the time yeah. for being uh, a station that couldn't put adult content out there. They sure came as close to the edge yeah. as they could. I mean, it was gory. <laughs> uh, Jacob Vargas, who plays Sammy, you've seen him now in Sons of Anarchy and Luke Cage. I actually Tony Crimes from Sons of Anarchy yeah. as well. Hugh Laurie who is most famous for House. We also talked about him in episode 103, 101 Dalmatians, our most popular episode, shockingly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it, we'll never understand why, but we're not going to complain either. No, so thank you here, Laurie, for that. And uh, just mere months after filming this, he'd go on to play House. Yep. So I, it might have even because of this movie he got House. I don't know. He would have been, I think, in Hollywood at the time to do the casting calls. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Scott Michael Campbell was Liddell, a uh, fairly, fairly uh, important character, probably uh, most notable for uh, Bro- Brokeback Mountain, but you know him from... Flubber, episode 107. Ah, I missed that one. <laughs> there we go. We, 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 we balance each other out. That's what That's the whole right. thing's right. Kavork Malakian, I, uh, yeah, Malakian. 
Uh, we talked about him. Uh, he was in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And Jared Padalecki, who uh, would, we'll talk about again because he's done a couple other remakes, Friday the 13th and House of Wax. And I think he, this was still before Supernatural. So. Yeah, it was. This was, this was maybe may in the role that got him Supernatural. Okay. Um, cause, yeah, I'm not sure based on what. <laughs> well, you, you never know. I mean, he was he was regular on uh, or, or a recurring role on Gilmore Girls at this point, and he'd just. I can't I can't think of being trapped in sand after taking a leak would be really great for your resume. No, but it, I, I think it showed the, the brief time he got did show that he was more than just that character from from Gilmore Girls. Yeah, right. And uh, he he just shot a couple pilots for standalone as lead. He was he was going to be in the he was originally cast as the lead for Young MacGyver, which never took off. Right. right. Um, but I did. guess that shows the strength of his character. I mean, I guess I can see why they killed him off first. I mean, he towered over everybody in that yeah. cast. Uh, and I can see where that might be a problem. Yeah, especially with... with, with <laughs> Maybe except for Hugh Laurie. But even if you make Hugh, Hugh Laurie look short, <laughs> yeah, you're pretty tall. He's a tall man. Like, Patrick, he's a really <laughs> tall guy. But, and again, he, he at this point, he was relatively unknown. Like, he, yeah. was, he was cast as the throwaway character. Yeah. Which is kind of weird because he's his character is Ernest Borgnine's oh, character. Yeah, for it sure. just happens in a blink of an eye. It does because they don't really give him a chance to establish his role, his character. It, there's a few scenes when they're at, at the oil camp where he's kind of clumsy, kind of goofy, mm-hmm. right? but there's no. And then, of course, he, he's here's the thing: is they set him up as uh, sort of the semi key character at the beginning of the movie because he's the one who sort of has to put his hat on, put it on backwards because it's good luck and all that stuff, right? Yeah. And then after the crash, there's a lot of conflict about that. And then, boof, he's gone. There's no resolution on that. And, well, not the only time that's, that kind of stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It is very true. Uh, it, I mean, he wasn't the only throwaway character because the guy who came fell at the back of the plane was definitely a throwaway character because he would, didn't even recognize him as an actor. He's just... Yeah, an extra, like, a blown out. <laughs> yeah, because I don't think he got any dialogue. He just, he just, he just they gave him a couple shots and then he got blown out of the plane. Yeah. But hey, he got to be a corpse on screen. Yes, he did. <laughs> hey, careers have started from that. Kevin Costner's career started as a corpse on screen. So there you go. <laughs> and he didn't even get a, 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 any close-ups. It was just his hand that you saw. Uh, let's exactly. talk about Miranda Otto for a second. Okay, the female, just to throw a female into the cast. It, it, that's and that's all she was. I mean, I guess she was kind of the sergeant character, but they didn't really give her anything because the dynamic was her and her boss Ian, which was Hugh Laurie, which kind of replaces that military thing. But she doesn't really do anything. She does nothing. You know, you think she does because they set her up fairly strongly at the yeah. beginning. Uh, you know that they're she's they're shutting down her business, and uh, Hugh Laurie's there to he's the economic guy figuring out the numbers. It's like they're just they're just nothing here. Sorry, um, yeah. we've got to shut down the drill. Yeah, and it sucks, but yeah, this is you promised me there was something here and there's nothing here. And she's like, give me just a little longer. And you think there's a story there and nah, nothing. No, that no, doesn't go, it goes nowhere. They give her a little bit of Attenborough stuff. Yeah. A little bit of it. I mean, Attenborough's but, dialogue spread out all over the place. Yeah. They, they, yeah. Instead of giving us sort of like one focal, like moral compass for the, for the film. And she they, would have been a good place. She would have been a really good replacement for that. And they didn't do it. No. Right? Like, Cause they, they gave some to the Campbell character. Mm-hmm. And then they gave some to her, and they gave some to Tyrese's character. I'm sorry, I, there's too many characters in here. I'm not remembering names. Yeah, remember the actors more than I remember. I, you know, but <laughs> just think about it a second. The only female at an oil site, an isolated oil site. She was probably really popular <laughs> among the men. <laughs> probably, and the thing is, they didn't set her up as to be like a hard asset in any way either, right? Like she was kind of like a friendly understanding kind of boss not of you got to get this done kind of boss yeah right? and that, there's an opportunity there to have some really great dialogue between ian hilary's character and miranda's character mm-hmm. because that, that could have been part of why they were shutting her down is because the, her management style wasn't working for this particular it, it just didn't work mm-hmm. right because these guys were they talked about how they're the garbage of the oil patch right they're these guys who weren't able to stay on in other jobs mm-hmm. right and they needed a firm hand and she wasn't that firm hand yeah Right. They were her buddies instead of her instead of her. Yeah, and if employees. they would have shown that, or if they would have shown that she is, I don't know. Like they just, 
it, the, there was just not enough character development with any of those characters. In fact, when you see that scene in the office, you don't even see any of the other guys until they're loading up on the plane. I'm like, wouldn't it have made sense to see some of them walking around at some point just to set up that, yeah, these guys are also working uh, on site here? Yeah, or that could have established how her management style didn't work is they could they at least shown them all sort of being lazy yeah right? sitting around drinking coffee and laughing instead of instead of doing the work they were supposed to wow, be doing this technically was last day so <laughs> yeah but still it, it, it would have been it, they should have been getting ready to load up the plane and mm-hmm. all that stuff but instead they're doing they're goofing off yeah right like they, they, they could have established that a lot better yeah but i mean we're remaking a remake as usual um, <laughs> well i mean these are kind of lost opportunities yeah. but it shows how much that extra 20 minutes kind of meant to the original film it it yeah that's that like like i said i mean i was i, I bitched about it i mean I didn't really bitch i just had to give jay a hard time but because sometimes you need to have this long these long run times to make a film work and this is a really classic case of that mm-hmm. I, I mean we talk about some of these like late 60s early 70s films where the runtime seems just to there to be a runtime mm-hmm. right there's a lot of filler and stuff like this there's no filler in this original movie no uh, 222 minutes every single moment means something yeah i mean they're they're trying to make in the remake here the dialogue more they're trying to make it more efficient and that also takes away from the characters because there's a lot of little moments, those stutters that Attenborough puts into his character. I don't know if it's a case of he's just not remembering his line right away or what, but it adds to his character. It does. Well, it even though it's it's only sort of touched on his, his alcoholism, he's also going to be going through withdrawal if he's an alcoholic. Yeah. Right? So it could have been an affectation that he added to sort of hint at the fact that he, He's suffering, but he's still playing the strong character, mm-hmm. right? And it, it was actually you know, when you talk about performances. I mean, you you didn't get a single bad performance in, in either movie, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It's, even some of these characters, are the people who aren't really actors, like Sticky Fingers, he didn't have a lot, but his screen time was 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 good. What was his fucking eye patch about? I have no when idea. When did that happen? <laughs> I'm like, what the? F- <laughs> did he just go and say, "I want a fucking eye patch"? <laughs> and then gave him an iPad. You know, I, I, and, and this is going to sound really terrible, but in 2004, I could see them doing this. Is they gave it to him to make him more distinguishable from the, from the other ethnic characters in the movie. And it is very much a thing that would have happened mm. in the 2004s. Is, is, is they give them something that makes them distinguishable. Yeah, so you're not confusing them with uh, Tyrese. Yeah. That- but there was yeah. no confusion. I don't no, know why like, they would do that. But sticky fingers I, is bald, and Tyrese at the time had hair. Yes, it was so, kind of caught me off guard. Actually, yeah, it, it did too. I was so used to being bald for Fast and the Furious yeah. that it was like, whoa, yeah. you look weird with hair. <laughs> and you, until you get used to it. But yeah, I, and I said that probably sounded really terrible. But knowing Hollywood and knowing how they would sometimes do stuff like that, mm-hmm. it wouldn't surprise me if that's all it was. Maybe. I mm-hmm. mean, if we would have seen him get injured in the crash. To his eye, and I don't recall ever seeing that. No, because he had the, he had the eye patch for, uh, at, at the camp, right? So that's bullshit. Because yeah. <laughs> it does look like a make, makeshift kind of eye patch. So why don't you set that up as an injury? At least then you could have had some medical treatment. This makeshift eye patch it would have meant something. Yes, it, it it was a really one of those weird things that didn't fit into the story in any way. No, it was just so, some sort of way of giving him character. Yeah. It's dumb. Yeah. I hated it. Yeah, ditto. (laughs) I would have to agree with you. (laughs) I did like the music in the the remake, though, uh, but it was just to give some montages. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it was was sort of the standard rock and roll. Yeah. Sort of background music, but... Well, they had Hey Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, they did, uh, which, which, again, funny montage, completely unnecessary. They, 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 They could have... Well, they I guess use they, that screen time better. Yeah, I guess this is their way to do a little more passage time, and that was a big fault of this film. Was I didn't feel the passage of time, even though they actually make it longer than the original film. Yeah, and I didn't feel the passage of time happening in the remake near as well as I did in the original film. No, I have to agree. It's like how much time has passed. Yeah, it, does, it, does, it doesn't feel like. Yeah, they say they had thirty days of water. Yeah. And 
you know, they're getting down to the nitty gritty, but you don't feel like it. Whereas I think it was like half that in the original. It was 12 days. Yeah. And they were could uh, extend it with the antifreeze distillation. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, they may have had 15 days. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, the, the, our engineer had said, I can, we can do it in 12 days. I have it figured out. We can do it in 12 days. Mm-hmm. And they never, ever mention that in the remake. And they add all these extra action scenes instead of creating the, the tension the way they should. Mm-hmm. That are we going to get out of here tension? Instead, they do things like sandstorm after sandstorm after fucking sandstorm, <laughs> and lightning and, and 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 lightning storm. We have the to get on the plane. Storm, the electric yeah. storm, and it's like get away from the plane because it's not grounded. Yeah, and and, and well, and ground. Yeah, and, but Greg, get it grounded because it's got the, fuel in the wing. Yeah, right? and the only thing that really does sets off is you'd think a plane designer would know that. Well, and uh, yeah, and that's they, a little hint of what's what the twist is going to be at the end. Yeah, that which he's a toy designer, and, and that fit really well. But instead of cr- creating the 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 core tension of this movie is will they get out? Yeah, right. It, they seem to concentrate more on survival situations yeah. than just existing in the moment of surviving. It's not like it is. you need more life-threatening things than the plane crash itself it, and the environment that you have to keep throwing more and more things at these guys. Exactly. Like, the, okay, the nomads are bigger threats. You've you got get, electrical storms. The, and, the plane's built, but now they get that, that sandstorm that... That huge sandstorm that buries that, it. That which, buries it, which was a pointless thing to do because they just unbury it, and the next it's, scene, there you see him towing it in, into position. You don't even. You only see the briefest of moments of them starting to dig, and then that's it. Well, and I, I mean that that scene existed for one thing and one thing only: Frank's motivational speech. Yeah, that is the only reason that that five minutes even existed in that movie. I, yeah, it's it's silly because I don't know. We've had enough motivational speeches and stuff. We don't need the Braveheart moment again. That was something they did before. Was in the original film when that revelation happens. It happens in private that this guy is is a model designer. Yes, and they decide to keep that information to themselves to not cause any more tension within the men and have them or lose, to break the morale and break the morale and lose their hope. Whereas that whole conversation is completely public in the remake and just to cause stir the pot and stir some shit. Well, and it leads to another unlikable moment with Frank where he punches Elliot, mm-hmm. right? Because then it becomes a fight instead of, instead of this moment of growth for Frank, mm-hmm. where Frank makes a conscious decision. It's like, you know what? We got duped, but this could still work. Mm-hmm. So let's keep the guys motivated, keep their hopes up. And in, keep that secret between him and Attenborough. Right. right? It's, it works so much better and it shows character growth. Whereas nothing in this movie shows, or in the remake, shows Frank's growth. Everything he does is reluctant until that last moment where the fucking sandstorm blows over and buries the, the plane. Mm-hmm. Then he's like, yeah, we can do this. Raw, 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 we can do this. It, it comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Right? Because he's a dick right up until that moment. Yeah. Even though he's agreed to do it, he's still a dick. It's, I think that's... When I saw, I saw the first time, I didn't notice it. But seeing the way Stuart had played the character, you really notice it with, with, with the way Quaid chose to or he was forced to play him. Yeah, it was just resistance. They, it was always just the unlikable tension between Stuart and, and Hardy in the original film. Whereas this one, it was just, I'm going to be... We're, they're both being dicks all the time. Yes. Yeah, it's... Yeah, and I, I, when you have actors as talented as Rabisi and Quaid, these guys know how t- to nuance a role. Mm-hmm. You should have let them. Yeah. I, I mean, Rabisi was almost there. They just didn't give him anything likable mm-hmm. to do. Uh, you gave, they gave him that bit of a heroic moment at the end, but it's not enough to really redeem the character in your thoughts and minds. Like, we've already done that in the original film long before they take off. Yeah, he has his pouty moment and uh, the conflict. I mean, the big moment there was who's in charge. And he feels like a mustache twirling despot in in the remake. He does. Where it was like, okay, who's in charge of this project? It's me. Let's get back to work. He doesn't make anybody beg for him to get back to work. No, it was directly contradictory to the way Rubisi was playing the character the rest of the way, all the way up until that point. Mm -hmm. Because he's kind of childlike. 
Yeah. All the way up to there. And right to the point of being in tears when he has his pouty moment. Like he's, he's actually actively distressed and crying. He's, he's, he's about what's happened. Mm-hmm. So to turn around and, and be this sort of mustache twirling villain mm. didn't make sense. It did. It, it, it fell really flat. Yeah. It was just trying to exercise his control, uh, especially the, like, I'm the only one who's not dispensable <laughs> in this process. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and in respect to it, they could have, they, he still could have played that type of, that, that sort of making people beg for it because mm. it does, it could have played really well into the fact that he's kind of childish. Yeah. But the way they did it didn't work. Yeah. I, I think in the original film, like he does not take criticism well and it kind of puts him in this spiraling depression. Yes. And where I think he was just having a fit in the remake. Yeah. It just like, well, fine. Screw you guys. Yeah. It, he was having his stamping your feet temper tantrum. Yeah. And it worked well for the way Ruby C played the character, mm-hmm. but the events afterwards needed to continue that forward better. Yeah. At least in the original film, you feel like he is starting to get along with the men and yeah. you start to like him along the way. You just don't get it with Rubisi, unfortunately, because they didn't write it that way. I don't think he, it was anything to do with Rubisi's performance. He's one of, he was very dedicated to that role as far as his execution of it, but they just didn't give him those moments. No, they really didn't. It, it, and even when they tried to do it, like they forced it at the end with the handshakes and all that mm. stuff, it felt forced. Yeah. Oh, and the fucking photographs at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so the, Frank the future becomes of NASA? The, yeah, free, yeah, future of NASA is Rubisi and Dennis Quaid and AJ um, start an airline. I'm like, wouldn't they still be broke? Or like, I guess they had pretty good insurance on that plane. Or they something. must have, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, the the uh, I mean, the ending is the ending. Uh, they they tried to give you to amplify that feel good moment of the of, of them flying off into the sunset. But in the remake, it would have worked better. It's better if they just shown them flying into the sun and and not bothered with anything else. Just gone credit gone to credits without the without the photographs. Yeah, you just you see the destination in the background. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yep. Done. In in the original, them arriving at the at, at the next at the depot was f- at least funny mm-hmm. and, and entertaining because all these oil roughnecks are going, "What the hell is that? What is that?" Right? <laughs> yeah, and they like pile out and yeah. run to the water it, oasis. Yeah, exactly, and it, it it added a little bit of levity and 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 joy to the end of 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 what was really a, a, a tense movie. All the way through it, mm-hmm. right. uh, even the even like that that final scene where the plane's taking off. There's no nomads chasing them. It's just the tension of are they or are they not going to get yeah. off the ground? Yeah, and that's the the remake. Just it, okay. Let's let's have the added thing with the nomads. It's tense enough. Just trying to get out of there. Yeah, it's not an need... Indiana Jones movie. You do not need the army of nomads on horseback chasing them. Yeah, I'm like, it, what was it, like 10 guys by the time it's left? It's even less than that. I think it's like, yeah, uh, seven or eight by the seven time. Seven or eight. Mm-hmm. And this nomad that escaped from the initial meeting there when when Towns kills him, he brings like a fucking army. <laughs> yeah, there were hundreds of them. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, Jesus Christ, what were y'all going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it would have being pretty anticlimactic if you would actually had actually caught them because there yeah. aren't very many of them to catch. No. But it was a really weak attempt to add tension to an already tense situation. Yeah. It felt tacked on. It did, yeah. It, it, it felt, it was absolutely unnecessary. I agree. They were trying to add tension and like, you don't need it. The, just that survival moment's enough. Trying to get the plane off the ground is enough. That's- yeah, it, but it, it, that's one of those things that we saw happening in the, from the, about the mid-90s to about the mid but you know what the nomads watts, right? did was like they cut that that rudder uh, uh, rope. That Again, added were, tension that didn't need to be there. No, so we got to see Rubisi climb back down to reattach it. That was his heroic moment, his moment yeah. of redemption. Again, see what you're trying to do, didn't need to. And considering he didn't have any other lead up to being redemption other than we could build this plane so I can survive. Yeah. <laughs> I might have had him fall off the fucking plane. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly would have been changed from the original. Yeah, right? <laughs> it was one of those things. It was about spectacle, right? Yeah. It was like this will look really good on screen, kind of moment. Not this helps move the story along, kind of moment. Yeah, we're starting to see a move back to storytelling versus showing us things that we that look good on screen. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, they still do that, but it usually also helps tell the story. Yeah. And that's, they had a few moments in this movie where it, it was there for the sake of being there, not to move the story forward. Yeah. Well, I mean, with both of these movies being financial failures, I don't think a third attempt is probably going to happen. <laughs> no, I doubt it. Yeah. I could, well, I could see it being a, like a Netflix or something, TV movie or whatever, but I doubt anybody will, will attempt this again. It's a good story, though. It is. It's a great story. And, it, I mean, it doesn't need to be retold again. I, I, I think the original stands, stands on its own so well. Mm-hmm. And it is a shame that it didn't get recognized for how well made it was until much later. Yeah, I'm, I maybe I should have probably checked to see what it was competing against at the time. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, it uh, it certainly wasn't the cast's fault. It, it wasn't the cast's fault. It wasn't the story's fault. It wasn't the filmmaking. Just Everything is just so well done. It wasn't something that anybody wanted to see at the time, I guess. Yeah, and, it, and that might have been it. just might not have been one of those things. that It was one of, the, one of those things that was a done right from start to finish, mm-hmm. but it just didn't have yeah, the Yeah, sometimes right it's just timing. Yeah. I mean, maybe something big opens and overshadowed it or it was just wrong time good movie at the wrong time yeah you know what it may be one of those things that was too soon after the book because the book was like optioned i think probably out released because this they, they were within a year of each other oh geez so that's a, that's a bit of a problem too is because has that book reached enough hands for it to draw an audience yeah and so and in, that may have been the medium. thing right is yeah. is that it was people weren't making that connection yeah and how well did the book do yeah Right, is one of the things that they optioned and started filming as soon as it came out, and were committed. And when the book didn't do all that well, yeah, because right? like, I'm not familiar with the book. I don't know if it was if it was a bestseller or or if it's considered a classic of its time. I don't know. I, yeah, right? that's something that we could have looked up but didn't. Um, yeah, well, that's Melissa over at Book Reading. Yes, <laughs> we're we're a movie podcast, not a book a podcast. Uh, and sometimes these our, our trains of thought take us into places that we don't go when we're watching either, right? Yeah, and it's sometimes yeah we just don't think about doing the research at the time. And now that we're in the podcast, well, shit, I should have looked that up. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> well, anything to add to Flight of the Phoenix? I think uh, I think that was a pretty good uh, conversation about these guys. Yeah, you know. I, I don't have a lot to add. I will say that even though I'm, I, I, I think that the remake was an, was an, was as usual. Yeah, or, it was inferior. Was an inferior remake. It was one of the better remakes that we've done. Uh, yeah, I it, think I think the uh, Rotten Tomatoes is is overly harsh for it. If you've never seen the original, watch the remake before you do. I think you'll enjoy it more. Oh, for sure, because it's for still sure. it's still a, a, a it's still a fun ride. Mm-hmm. It's just. Not as strong as the original. Yeah, I de- highly recommend the original. The original was was an exceptional film that I really enjoyed. There were little nitpicky things in performances that probably were fine in the '60s that don't age too well. That that moment where just like somebody died and he's like punching his leg, like ah, damn it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like ah, I don't know if that works. It looks kind of silly when you're watching it, but maybe it does and. And it feels like an affectation that stayed in the 60s. It, I, you've, I've seen it in movies since, but that's usually, again, and, and, this is, and maybe this is why they do it. You see it, see it in, in more modern films is, is because of, it, was something, it was sort of Borgnine's things or, or a, 60, a 60s trope. Because, uh, again, his character doesn't come across as, as um, somebody who has a mental break. He comes across as somebody who's learning disabled. Like he's mm-hmm. he, he's he's capable, but he to of functioning, but he has emotional issues and stuff. Yeah, like I didn't that, right? think that was great either. Yeah, but. right. And that's the kind of thing that you see now in characters who are are learning um, disabled or emotionally mm-hmm. um, stunted. Is they do that kind of beating on their leg kind of thing. Well, that was George Kennedy though. That wasn't. Oh, that was George Kennedy, right? Yeah, too. That wasn't Borgnine. Yeah. So, right, and we'll, I don't I, know. I just feel like that that's something in the 60s that they're uh, something visual to convey to the audience since they're not the focal point of the scene. Yeah, and that's po- that's possible and, and and likely even but it's it's interesting because when I was watching that I saw that I that's I I thought forward to like the 80s and 90s when you'd see that with those emotionally stunted characters, mm-hmm. right? Where they weren't capable of expressing emotions yeah. so they And uh, no, that wasn't George Kennedy, but we didn't George really didn't get enough on screen for us to figure out what kind of character he actually was. No. He was no. one of the few that uh, didn't, which is a shame because I mean he was he probably even then a fairly big name, so I don't know if he'd got his Oscar yet. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't either. But, but yeah, it, 
and they they really did keep him in the background a lot. Right? Yeah. Again, because he's so much taller than everybody else in this yeah, movie. Yeah, he's such a big guy. Yeah. 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 But yeah, I mean, it was it was it was fun to watch Jimmy Stewart. I mean, he, he playing a, a physical role at this stage in his life, mm-hmm. right? Because I mean, it was quite a physical role for for. Yeah, he would have been in his sixties, I think, at this uh, point, wouldn't it? I don't think he would have been that old. Probably his fifties. Yeah, because I mean, he he was active right up until the eighties, right? So yeah, he was. So yeah, he's probably probably in his in his fifties. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that was Flight of the Phoenix. Uh, next week we're going to be starting our month long women in horror episodes. So we're going to be keeping women in horror as our focal point. Women in horror has been going about ten years. It's a it's a charity blood drive, as well as the celebration of of actresses, directors, writers uh, of the horror medium. So we're going to take a look at some of those. Uh, some we're going to do our own remakes on and others we're going to compare because they have had their own remakes. We'll do our usual shtick, but the focal point will be women on horror and we're not the only ones getting in on women in horror. You can follow the hashtag and see all the other podcasts involved on Hashtag all the horror, as well as um, uh, the W I H M W I H M or hashtag women in horror. There you go. You can see other events as well on those uh, last two hashtags, and uh, there'll be other lots of podcasts getting in there with either one or two episodes and full lists. And uh, when they drop, are going to happen on hashtag all the horror. So make sure you follow all the horror on Twitter, all the horror eighteen on Twitter. Yes. And, of course, you can follow us at Invasion Remake on Twitter, Invasion of the Remake on Facebook and Instagram, and Invasion of the Remake at gmail.com if you want to send your questions, your comments, your corrections, and your suggestions. Just don't shout at us. Yeah, don't yell at us. <laughs> we know that we don't know everything. <laughs> we don't pretend to. <laughs> mm-hmm. We weren't there. We weren't born in the 60s. No. and <laughs> Yeah. Well, you were. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> uh, there were eight days left in the 60s when I was born. <laughs> eight. Flower child. <laughs> eight. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> eight. 60s kid. <laughs> God damn it, it was just low over a week, Jay. <laughs> Eight. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Um, <laughs> How many, Sam? Eight. <laughs> I probably sound kind of learning, <laughs> challenged myself right now, don't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> don't be a Borg nine. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, good grief. Yeah, so we got some cool, cool stuff lined up for you over the month, next month uh, for women in horror. So don't miss it. You're gonna love some of the the choices. And there's there's one in particular I've been probably waiting the, the entire podcast to do. It just keeps getting bumped. So. Yeah, if this is the one I'm well, there's two that I'm actually really excited. Well, I'm excited about all of them to be honest. But the one next week I'm excited about. But I, the one in three weeks I think is the one you're talking about. That's the one. I'm nervous as fuck about this one. <laughs> yeah, because it's one of those. We really like the movie. I don't know if we could actually make it better, but we'll see. <laughs> it's been a while since I watched it. But it's worth the discussion, if nothing else. It really is. It really is. It's, it's, it's an important film in a lot of ways. And it's so important in so many ways, actually. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, let's, I, I, we'll, 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 we'll save keep, it. Yeah, we'll keep you in suspense, just like this movie did, for a little while longer yet, though. For sure. And hey, why don't you guys do us a favor? And while you're uh, out there, you know, listening to the podcast, tell your friends and family about the show, help get more earballs on the show and uh, leave us a five star rating and a short review on the platforms you find us. And we're on a ton of different platforms. Most notably, we're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music and Radio Public, where we get a little kickback from Radio Public. So um, listen to us there as well. And uh, if you want to see all the places places well i don't even know all the places we're at to be honest we are so many places but uh you can uh, hop on any of our social media sites and there's a link tree there that links to a whole lot of different places and platforms and uh, just search us out on whatever your favorite podcast provider is chances are we're there yeah just search us on google yeah. i mean we're there we're the first page of results 
Yeah. Hey, you know the easiest way to do it? Like, if you have an iPhone? Hey, Siri, subscribe me to Invasion of the Remake podcast. Just to confirm, would you like to subscribe to the podcast Invasion of the Remake podcast by Shifty Eyes Media? Yes. Okay, I've subscribed you. Done. Done. That easy. So, no excuses. Listen to the show. Uh, We'll catch you next week. I've been Jason. I am always Sam. And we are out of here. What, what about the big stuff? Is it a different department or what? The biggest I've personally designed is the Jäger 250. Uh, could I have this a moment, please? Yeah. Wait, that's, uh, here. That is Jäger 250. It won the prize for extended flight at Frankfurt last year. Extended plate? Yes. The radio control also was my design. And then on the opposite page there, there's another rather fine model. It's called the Schwalbe. It's there. Yes, yes but I, I think what Mr. Towns meant was the, the, the real thing. Uh, how much designing have you done on the uh, real thing? The real thing? Well, yes, uh, you know, like this. Oh, no, 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 you misunderstand. We make nothing but uh, model aeroplanes. You mean you never designed a full-sized aeroplane? Full-size? No. No, but, but then, of course, the principles are the same. Well, yes, they would be, wouldn't they? And of course, one, one encounters different problems, but... Uh, Basically, the principles are the same. I think I'd better check on the control linkages. He's crazy, Lou. He builds toy airplanes. I don't think there's any difference.